beautiful quixotic adventure. I think you're tilting at windmills. It's good. LAFCO, the Los Angeles Filmmakers Cooperative, was started in 2000 when a group of underground filmmakers bought a 1985 Chevy school bus on eBay and converted it into a fully self-sufficient digital studio on wheels. Emblazoned on one side of the graffiti-painted school bus were the words of Jean Cocteau. Film will only become art when its materials are as inexpensive as pencil and paper. Like a stealth vehicle, you know, it's like a stealth life. You'll never believe what's going on in there from the outside. But as soon as you step aboard, oh man, it's like the it's like the Starship Enterprise. In 2001, three LAFCO filmmakers set out to cross the country and make films with artists, poets, and musicians across America. Seven months and several films later, they had only made it as far as Northern California and had to return home. During the next five years, the LAFCO bus regularly attended the Burning Man Festival in Nevada, traveled to Mexico, started a commune in an old powerhouse in Venice, California, made dozens of short films, documentaries, and music videos, and produced Camjackers, LAFCO's first feature film. Finally, it was time to fulfill LAFCO's dream of crossing the United States. Nine people embarked on what was supposed to be a 30-day journey. Native American filmmaker Cody Lusich, filmmaker and musician James Wade, artist and activist Felicia, AKA 5150, lyricists KP and Vince Carnage, photographers Cosby and Steve Newman, Bus driver Catherine Rossum and founder Tao Rusbully boarded the bus looking for the intersection of art and politics in America. This is their story. Daddy, can you just explain for a second what it is that you've been working on so hard and beautifully on? Let's see. Well, basically, uh, what we've been working on is putting this platform up on here. It's customized platform application on top of the uh, mobile production vehicle. Are you happy with your work? That's a trick question. I probably would like to have like a little bit more time to fine tune it. But you know, it's just like when the children of Israel had to leave Egypt. You have to go ahead and leave with the unleavened bread because you have to, you have to leave and make haste. You guys with all these cameras. I tell you, we rebuilt everything except for the inside of the engine. <laughs> We've redone the carburation, exhaust, ignition, all the hoses, belts, all the fluids. What are the odds that the bus now makes it all the way oh. to New York without a breakdown? Oh, it, it's, it's fine. So we're here at the very beginning of our trip. Our first stop is just up the street at the parking lot of the Rose Cafe where the bus was parked for over a year. I live where the LAFCO van is now parked, and we're meeting our first political artist. <laughs> One of the very few places you could get my posters and actually pay for them was at the Rose Cafe. Arnold would come over, you know, with his Cuban cigar and his boys. He started complaining to the Rose Cafe. Well, I'm not, I'm telling everybody not to come in. He basically intimidated them into not carrying my posters. I'm not here to make money. I'm here to get even. <laughs> He does have three positive posters. Uh, one of Gandhi, one of uh, Martin Luther King, and one of the Dalai Lama. And we've asked him, and he's volunteered, to put those three and express his art on the LAFCO van right before we take off. It was after 9-11, and that was a terrible tragedy. And I'm from New York, so it's like my neighborhood. It was terrible, and our response to it was terrible. You know, our government kind of, I think, maybe overreacted just a little bit, like bomb the shit out of these people for the second time, uh, go halfway across the world, spend billions and billions of dollars, rip people out of their homes, not to mention what they did to the Iraqis, and then declare a worldwide perpetual war on terror so that they can do whatever they want because it's wartime conditions and the executive branch gets more power, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a little bit of an overreaction, so I thought, wouldn't it be cool, karmically speaking, if Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, Martin Luther King, kind of peaceful warriors, people who made social and political change by nonviolent methods, were looking at us on the streets going, what the hell are you doing? 
not just art about politics, it is politics. Doing it is a political act. It's a hostile act, usually, along with everything else. You know, a statement that I exist and just because you are ignoring me or, you know, I'm invisible to you doesn't mean I can't, like, piss on your turf. Have you ever gotten busted? Yes. Have you gone to jail? Yes. Here we are at my home in Venice Beach, California. Home and studio, right? Home and studio, yes. I make public art, murals. I'm a painter and a graphic designer. When I first began painting, the murals that we created were very much in reaction to what was going on in Chile, to restore democracy in Chile and speak about human rights issues. My father was close friends with Salvador Allende, a man who was elected president of Chile in 1970. My father was appointed as the ambassador from Chile to the United States on September 11th, our first September 11th, 1973. The military overthrew the Allende government. Many of the people that worked with Allende, including my father, were either killed or imprisoned. And my father was held in various concentration camps for a year where he suffered enormous physical and uh, emotional torture. Eventually, we returned to Washington, D.C., where my father was very effective in denouncing the Chilean military dictatorship led by Augusto Pinochet and denouncing mass disappearances, imprisonments, and other atrocities that were happening in Chile at that time. A hit squad was sent out to kill my father. They planted a C2 explosive bomb underneath my father's Malibu classic. My father died almost immediately in the bomb blast. There were two other people in the car, Ronnie Carp and Moffitt. Some people say to me, boy, it's a shame that you don't paint political murals anymore, because for them, a political mural always has somebody with a raised fist and somebody right. say, down with the man. Many people think of political art as being in reaction to some oppressive system upon people. And that may or may not be happening in the murals, but what's always happening in the murals is this secondary thing, which is really the root of community movement, people coming together and building community. Thank you very much. Kazoo! Cards, man. Huh? Cards, the play cards? Yeah, yeah, I bring it. Yeah. You bring it? I got it. Yep. My name is Kazvi, doing a, taking a photography. We just pulled up to Oliver Stone's editing studio, and we're going to ask him a few questions about art and politics. So we all know Oliver Stone for Platoon, Salvador, JFK. All his films are political. Gandhi's watching us. Dalai Lama's waiting for us to get hip, and he's still dreaming. It takes eccentricity and strength. Psychology and life, politics. Politics to me is always, is not a different subject. It's not a dry, uh, uh, separate. Politics is part of what you and I are doing now. Yeah. Having a, it's, it is a political discussion in a way. Right. Politics Absolutely. is part of life. Do you think there's value in doing art that few people are going to see, but is strong in its message? Or do you think it's better to aim for just the largest possible audience? When I went to film school in 1969 and 70, you know, when I, I was at the time, at the beginning, when they were making, when I saw a film like Z by Costa Gavras or Battle of Algiers uh, by De Ponte Corvo, those films were, uh, energized me to believe that, wow, we could, we can make politically, uh, political movies in an entertaining and exciting convent uh, that would fit inside the conventional movie narrative uh, tradition, and that is what excited me. Any words of wisdom for us as we go out, what we should look for, or what we should be asking people, or? Use skillful means yeah. to get your message across and avoid some of the cities. Remember, Easy Rider, when that came out, was a very political movie in 1969. And the, in the South, they loved the ending because the, the two hippies got shot. So that was a happy ending for them. Remember that.